Today in the news, we got some Intel, Nvidia, and a little bit of Microsoft. What's up guys, I'm Snows, and this is your boot sequence. Let's get started with Nvidia. On that last video, we summarized the information available through leaks and rumors in regards to their upcoming RTX 3090 GPU. Well, this weekend, some more information came out about the RTX 3080, so let's take a look at that. The information comes from Rogame on Twitter, who found an entry for the GPU on userbenchmark.com. As you can see, it's titled simply as Nvidia Graphics Device, which is common for unreleased GPUs. As for the specs, we don't have the precise clock speed, but instead the clock and memory limits. While there are no specific definitions from user benchmark as to what clock limit and memory limit means, we can assume at least for the clock limit that it's the limit that the specific model can reach before changing its power limits. That's what I gathered from other users online who saw their CLIM change once power limits were changed. It doesn't mean that it will reach that clock though. In fact, with the Pascal and Turing cards I found, everyone who had their GPU benchmarked were close but didn't hit the clock limit. In any case, the CLIM is at 2100 megahertz, but the actual clock at its release will likely be closer to 1700 megahertz, which is leaked from the RTX 3090. So it looks like Ampere cards will clock around the same as Turing ones. If we look at the memory limit, it is set at 4750 megahertz. This would mean an effective clock of 19 gigahertz, right in line with the specs of GDDR6X that we saw last week from Micron. We also got confirmation of the 10 gigabytes of VRAM. As for the CUDA core count, since Copite7Kimmy over on Twitter has been very accurate with his leaks in the last few months, I will use his information to complete the specs chart at 68 SMs and 4,352 CUDA cores. So yeah, here are all of the rumored slash leaked specs. Moving on, we got Intel. So after their architecture day, we were left with very little information about their upcoming XEHPG platform. All Intel really told us is that it brings the compute efficiency of HPC, the scalability of HP, and the graphics efficiency of their LP platform. That's mostly just fluff marketing. As for the manufacturing process, Intel confirmed that HPG would not be manufactured in-house, but rather by an external fab. This means that HPG will not use the 10 nanometer super fin process that Intel has been showcasing since it's only available in house. So what process are they going to use? Well, according to a report by IT Home picked up by WCCF Tech, TSMC is likely to win the bid for Intel's HPG lineup. Not only that, but it will use TSMC's 6 nanometer node, aka N6. This process node should actually be more advanced when compared to AMD's upcoming use of 7 nanometers, which could either be N7P or N7 Plus. So what's the difference? Well, there are all improvements over TSMC's deep ultraviolet N7 process currently used by Zen 2 and RDNA. N7P is simply an optimized version of N7, which still uses deep UV. Going up a notch is N7 Plus, which uses extreme ultraviolet, but only for some critical layers. This would bring up to 10% more performance at the same power envelope, or up to 15% more efficiency, and up to 1.2 times the density. N7 Plus is the most likely candidate for Zen 3 and RDNA 2, but AMD hasn't really confirmed it. Then we have N6, which is what the report says Intel will use. 18% more dense than N7P and more EUV layers than N7 Plus. Whether those improvements will be enough for Intel's current architecture to be competitive is still something we don't know. Intel's stream processors are currently severely lagging behind AMD and Nvidia in performance, but Intel does seem to cram a whole lot more of them in their chips, so maybe that's their game plan. I don't know, maybe 700 plus EUs, which would equate to about 6,000 plus stream processors? That could be competitive. Lastly, let's jump into some Microsoft news. If you've updated your Insider build for Windows 10 in the last few days, you now have even more control over your GPU usage. The latest build allows you to select a GPU on a per app basis. For example, you could set a game or app to always use your discrete GPU while using integrated graphics for other apps. This is a great feature for notebook users. You won't have to worry if your PC is using its iGPU to save battery life. On the other end, 
end and I'm going to test that out in the future, you can technically have multiple discrete cards on your desktop and assign a GPU for specific applications. You could, for example, in my case, use one GPU to render an app and the other to game. That could be pretty interesting. And that is pretty much it for the news today, guys. Hopefully you've enjoyed. Drop a like if you liked it, a comment if you want to talk about today's stories. As usual, you can click right here to see the latest video right here to subscribe to the channel. Stay frosty, my dudes, and I'll see you on the next one. Take care.